Water, when unmanipulated, is to find its level. So whether you look at a cup of water, a bathtub, a swimming pool, a lake, or the ocean, it's flat. Of course, natural motion is not considered and doesn't equal a curve. We have zero authentic pictures of the Earth and they're all composites, and NASA even admits that they Photoshop Earth images. It is Photoshopped, but it's, it's, has to be. On numerous occasions, NASA admits that we can't go beyond low Earth orbit, which is between 99 miles and 1,200 miles away. The interesting thing is that the moon is said to be 238,000 miles away, which is a difference of 236,800 miles. No matter if you're on the ground, on top of a building, a mountain, a hot air balloon, an airplane, or looking at high altitude amateur balloon footage, the horizon never fails to rise right to your eyes. Whether you are looking at Toronto's skyline from Niagara on the lake, 31 miles away, Chicago's skyline from Union Pier, 43 miles away, or even Oahu from Kauai, which is up to 108 miles away from center to center, or 73 miles away from the closest points. You will not see any curvature where it's supposed to be. According to the Pythagorean theorem, which states that the curvature of the Earth is 8 inches per mile squared, Oahu should not be visible whatsoever, but you can see the whole thing. In 1887, Albert Michelson and Edward Morley conducted what's known as the Michelson-Morley experiment this experiment was attempting to prove the speculated motion of the Earth around the Sun. And when it failed, Albert Einstein was forced to form the theory of relativity to overcome this problem. In fact, anytime mainstream science is faced with undesirable results, they create a workaround which isn't real science at all. The Sun is claimed to be 93 million miles away, with a radius of over 400,000 miles, but can easily be proven to be much closer and smaller by tracing the crepuscular rays back to its origin in the sky. If the Sun were indeed 93 million miles away, it would simply be impossible to have angled sun rays, as they should all consistently come in straight. According to the globular theory, a lunar eclipse occurs when the Sun, Earth, and Moon are in a direct line. But it is on record that since about the 15th century, over 50 eclipses have occurred while both the Sun and Moon are visible above the horizon. F.H. Cook, The Terrestrial Plane It's a common misconception that the shadow of the Earth causes moon phases. Even the pastors and priests of the science religion readily admit this fact. The interesting thing about moon phases is that they are always the exact same eight phases repeated. But if we were circling around the sun, these eight phases would inevitably be reversed from the summer to winter seasons. I completely understand that the idea of a flattened stationary Earth seems ridiculous in many ways. But that's only because we are taught the false globe model from the very first time that we enter a school classroom. Not to mention the first time we are introduced to the concept of a flat earth, it's depicted as a highly laughable world where ships, boats, and water would run off of the edge. So I do get it, but it's all part of the deception. I've spent 30 years of my life believing that we were on a spinning globe. It wasn't until I unbiasedly and scientifically investigated the flat earth claims that I started to realize that there is more to this theory than I originally gave it credit for. Now, after almost two years of research, I'm certain that the Earth is flat. We are told that the Earth spins at 1,040 miles per hour, while the Earth travels around the Sun at 66,000 miles per hour. Meanwhile, the whole solar system is going inside the Milky Way galaxy at a speed of 490,000 miles per hour. And finally, the entire Milky Way galaxy is darting through infinite space at over 1 million miles per hour. Most people believe this. And yet, every experiment ever conducted to prove even the simple spin of the Earth has failed. The same thing goes for curvature. It's never been proven, and the only time we see it is in movies, NASA CGI, or when we're looking through a distorted fisheye lens. With all that said, please continue to research critically and don't be afraid to ask reasonable questions and speak out.
This presentation is for beginners like me, but I do believe that Flat Earth veterans might still be able to gain some insight and just look at things from a fresh perspective. These turned out to be about only half of the books that I owned that I used to make this presentation. I just kept grabbing more books to see what I could find. This slide is here for those people that care about credentials. Please keep in mind that as you go through this presentation that I am very new to this whole Flat Earth concept. We're talking about only four months or so. So excuse me if I'm not an expert, but my goal in this presentation is not for you to believe me or to convince you with my words, but rather to take you on a mental journey with me, the one that I've been through, so that you can do your own research and decide for yourself. So are you ready to open your mind and look at Earth objectively? Be prepared to pause this video presentation because I'm going to be going through the slides relatively fast and you might want to actually read them or write some notes for your own research. So get ready to say goodbye to the globe as you know it. So you might be thinking at this point, Fran, why do you care? Why should we care? You may be thinking, my family has gone their whole life for generations now thinking Earth is a globe. So what difference will it make in my life? I say, Think about all the waste. Do you really want your children, grandchildren, or others that you love wasting their tax money or any of their mind power or energy on lies? I've already done enough of it in my life, and I no longer want to waste any gifts that I have on supporting lies when the truth can hold the key to so much more amazing information. The next thing you may be wondering is, Fran, why do you believe Earth is flat anyway? How do you know Earth is a spinning globe? That's the question I ask you. Other than being told by allegedly smart people and seeing some nice fake pictures, other than that, how do you know that Earth is a ball in the middle of nowhere? How do you personally know? Like we've already established, knowing Earth is flat doesn't affect your mortgage payment directly. Would knowing make you freak out in any way? Can you handle the truth? You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Son, we live in a world that has walls, and those walls have to be guarded by men with guns. Who's gonna do it? You! You can handle it. Why do I say that? Because it seems most, if not all humans, have this innate sense that something bigger than themselves watches over them. If you were told that you were literally in the palm of a hand, you might freak out at first, but soon you'd be like, I knew it all along. Pass the beer nuts. Sometimes I would get physically nauseated when I tried to wrap my brain around the big idea of a flat earth plane. I was so used to the globe idea that my brain actually thought something was wrong with me when I tried to conflict with its set of standards. Let me out! Let me out! I want out! When people like me talk about flat earth, we're not talking about some 2D world. So please don't go there. What is this? A center for ants? Here are some maps of what Earth probably looks like. I know the flat Earth map looks a little freaky if you're not used to it. This map is taken from the leading pioneers in flat Earth theory. We're soon going to talk about why this map makes the most sense. In future slides, when I refer to the flat Earth model, this is the one that I'm referring to. If the map looked familiar, it might be because it's the United Nations logo or because it looks like one of the many types of map projections of Earth that you might have seen before. In this map, you could trace a line from point A to point B without ever picking up your pencil. Now you could do this on a globe as well, but globes are inconvenient, and I think that's why this has been, in my research at least, a favorite for those that travel vast distances over the oceans. And you may think that that's great and all, but how can it be a real world view? Well, that's because you haven't let go of the globe yet. Like I was saying, flat Earth is not a 2D world. Earth is the plane that we live on, but the world includes what is above us and below us and is actually very interesting and mysterious. Ask yourself something. Does the idea of being inside something you cannot escape from make you feel trapped? If it does, I ask you to remember that things like the magnetic field and the atmosphere are there to protect us, right? If we went into space, would we not die? Just like the globe model, we need to recognize that we are all dependent on this place that we live. How does one define flat? Let's look at our alleged galaxy. 
flat as a pancake with a special center, just like the flat Earth model. Even the alleged universe is said to be relatively flat. I saw some news that we are at the center of it. Imagine that. Maybe the radiation is coming from off the inside of the virtual bubble we live in. It's safe to say that the alleged universe, as science currently describes it, has a mind-bogglingly large amount of possibilities for how our alleged planet and solar system could have turned out, right? Then can somebody please tell me how much of a coincidence it is that our alleged planet has only one moon and one sun who just happen to be the right size and distance from us to render them about equal in size in the sky. Of all the possibilities, we can talk about other places like ours that have two suns and five moons of various sizes, but not us. The more I learned about astronomy, the more this coincidence bothered me. I just couldn't shake the question, what are the odds? Hello? Hello? Anybody home? Hey, think with flying fin. And the coincidences don't end there, though, do they? What about the moon, always facing the same way towards us? That's strange, isn't it? You just have to read this paragraph from a book called Creation of Science by Dr. Hugh Ross regarding the coincidence of life. And speaking of life, ours is the only known place that has what we define as life. Does that make us special? Sometimes scientists make us feel special because they tell us that they haven't found evidence of life elsewhere. And they ought to know they've been elsewhere, maybe. They tell us Earth is special because its distance to the sun is in the Goldilocks zone, not to mention just the right amount of rotisserie style spinning as to complete an even temperature. We're special then, right? Not so fast, because then scientists also tell us that our sun is ordinary on the outskirts of no less than an ordinary galaxy. As far as aliens go, I personally think that they are the celestial beings that the Bible talks about. But we're not going to get into that. I do believe that there is a lot going on behind the veil, but that doesn't prove Earth's shape one way or the other. So let's stay on track. And since we're talking about Earth's shape, I'll have you know that it's still up for grabs. As far as the whole pear shape thing, I think that might be a compensation for the truth which is that the outside, the southern hemisphere on the globe, is actually the outside of our flat plane that we live on. So the oceans are bigger around than they are in the center. But not only that, it's slightly wider below the equator than above the equator. A little chubbier. A little chubbier. Yeah. Chubby's a good way. It's like pear-shaped. Yeah. So it turns out the pear-shapedness is bigger than the height of Mount Everest above sea level. Now we've all seen this picture there on the top right hand corner in our books growing up. It was said to be the way that they made a close to accurate flat map from the shape of a sphere. Does it look right to you? Be honest with yourself. I found that if you simply pinch the two top areas together and then swing those four legs around to each corner, you actually get the basics of a flat earth map. Are you impressed with what we know about the moon? After all those alleged landings and all of our alleged satellite technology, we should know our supposed closest object inside and out, don't you think? Yet, we don't even know how it was formed or acquired. And what about self-illumination? Could there be something on the inside of the moon shining out through the surface? Just like the Uncle Milton's moon in my room toy? And what about moon equality? Could the moon and sun be about the same size and distance from us? In some of the later slides, we will discuss their distance more. But for now, let's just consider the equality that the Bible and ancient art and symbols give the sun and moon. Both the sun and moon have been used as guides for travelers throughout the ages. My favorite of all sun and moon equality symbolisms has to be the lion and the unicorn. The lion is the sun and the unicorn is the moon, and the legends behind their story are very fascinating. It's a story of duality and equality, much like the yin and the yang. Let's consider for a moment the images of the sun. I've got to say that I'm not a big fan of how science is showing our sun all the time. Science has a lot of image sources from instruments that detect various waves on the electromagnetic spectrum, and of all those images, why choose the red hellfire one? 
I suppose it shows the heat in a way we can understand, but it sure looks creepy compared to the beautiful pure white light that I'm used to seeing. Plus, our sun is supposed to be in the yellow range according to their charts, but in the images we're shown, it looks more like a burning ball of fire. Google, quote, NASA sun and see for yourself. I don't like the red hellfire lava sun because it degrades the sun and casts a negative light, pun intended, on it. How did Eratosthenes really do his calculations? We can't know, only what we are told, and I think we were told wrong. I think it is possible that Eratosthenes' great work has been warped to fit our new model. I'm also a little confused as to the timeline of this whole thing because Eratosthenes was alive well before Copernicus came along. And I don't think the folks of Alexandria, you know, people who built Obulus, believed we lived on a ball, did they? If you're not familiar with the concept used by Eratosthenes to do geographic calculations, then you can read the page from the book in this slide, or you can watch Carl Sagan's video about it. Now, Carl Sagan has to bend his Earth because the sun is 93 million miles away and the rays are supposedly, therefore, hitting the obelisks at a parallel. Now, I did a quick experiment in my own room with a light bulb, a flat bed, and some Lego obelisks and found that indeed there was a relationship between how far away the light source is and how big or small the short shadow will be. However, in the Flat Earth model, the sun is relatively close and the sun rays would not hit the two cities parallel. We've all seen sun rays coming from the clouds off in the distance. Do they look like they'll cast parallel rays to two cities 500 miles apart? Throughout this presentation, you'll see that I try to provide other explanations for things. Because for me, it's not enough to just say somebody is wrong. You have to explain why or how and maybe give examples of alternatives. So that's what I do. So we've talked about the solar eclipse and the sun and the moon, but what about the lunar eclipse? Is there really just one explanation for it? I've seen the moon during the day many times in places where it just didn't seem right with respect to the shadow and illumination it was showing, just like the one pictured here. There are so many legitimate pictures like this that are hard to explain. In this example, shouldn't, given the alleged distance of the sun, the light be illuminating the moon from behind? These anomalies only occur once in a while, like an eclipse, but can they be explained? Have you noticed during a lunar eclipse the moon always seems to go ultra bright in the not dark zone and then the darker it gets the more bright its light looks in the still light spots? Optical illusion or something else? I don't know. I really find it odd that this observation with eyes and regular cameras is not what is officially shown on science websites and books. See for yourself. Have you noticed that the part of the moon not illuminated by the sun or otherwise is basically invisible? It is up there in the dark, and without light, we cannot see it. Could there be other objects in our sky that we just can't see because they have no illumination? I think it's a real possibility. Before we move on, let's take a moment, just a moment, to consider Earth's age. I just want to say that I don't agree with the whole one day is a thousand years thing that many biblical scholars like to use. Sorry, but I just don't agree with it. This is why. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, it says, With the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. Can you not see that this is trying to demonstrate that for God, time is like nothing? It doesn't say that a thousand years is a day. It has the word as in it. And it doesn't just say that a thousand years is a day. It also says that a day is as a thousand years. Can people see that time's meaning is completely different for God? If that doesn't make you see, then how about Psalm chapter 90, verse 4, which says, For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past, and like a watch in the night. A thousand years are like yesterday. Do the math on that one. With that said, I also think science's billions of years old is unnecessary. It's only necessary if Earth coalesced into a ball from stardust by the magic of gravity instead of being created. I believe Earth is a creation from an immortal mind, God's work. 
How old Earth is? I don't know, of course, but I think it's quite ancient by our standards. Okay, what do you say we get back on track with the Earth is flat? Let's talk about geometry. How can we talk about the shape of Earth or anything without considering geometry? I've shown earlier the idea of us living on a globe, but we don't really know. Our world could be a cone or a cylinder, both of which when sliced create a circle to live on and still could support the things that I'm going to be asking you to consider in upcoming slides. After this presentation, it might be a good time for you to come back to this slide and consider the possibilities. Flat is where it's at. We're going to see a ton of this kind of stuff in the slides. It seems most astronomical phenomenon is best illustrated from an observer on a flat plane. If I had a dollar for every illustration I saw in my research that uses a flat frame of reference to describe astronomical observations, I would have enough money to take my family to a nice restaurant for dinner tonight. What in the world is going on there in that far right corner? Why do they have to show the horizon as flat and extended out like that? You know, way past the globe's curve. Okay, this anomaly, folks, for me, is personally one of the biggest. I just never could understand how they got a bar magnet type magnetic field from a ball. I just don't understand why they can't use a ball magnet as their examples. Do you? I also did some research on the aurora borealis in the north and the south and was not happy with what I found. Apparently the only lights that regular people in the southern hemisphere can get lucky enough to see are a far cry from what people in Canada are seeing. Check out what I found on TripAdvisor. This is just a regular guy and his account is as many others. Have you been to Antarctica and seen them? Are they the same? In some later slides, we'll talk about the many more differences between the alleged North and South Poles. But first, let's talk about some actual viable magnetic field options. Do you think something along the lines of a speaker magnet or a coiled inductor can be beneath our feet inside the bottom of the Earth? I placed some flat Earth maps over some of these examples. People who follow the everything is vibration theme might like the speaker magnet option, but those who follow the Eye of God theme might like the thing I did on the transformer. And I just have to say that after I made this, I couldn't shake the tune from the transformer show. Transformers the okay, people, what makes more sense? A ball with a pole magnet or a flat surface with one of these types of systems under it? And your compass still works and gets you right where you need to be on a flat earth map. People long before the globe was introduced could use the stars and a compass to navigate just fine, didn't they? But Fran, didn't Christopher Columbus prove that the Earth was a globe? No, Christopher Columbus did not prove the Earth was a globe. He proved that you can go in a circle by heading due west. That does not prove the globe. Here is his path on a flat Earth map. Are you impressed? And it makes me very mad when I hear the president make fun of flat earthers, talking about if we had been here when Christopher Columbus set sail. We're trying to move towards the future. They, they want to be stuck in the past. And we've heard this kind of thinking before. Let me tell you something. If some of these folks were around when Columbus set sail, they, 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 they must have been founding members of, of the Flat Earth Society. They, they would not have believed that the world was round. Look at what I'm saying, Obama, and you'll see that Columbus proved that you could go in a circle, not that we live on a globe. Wait, isn't this the same idiot that thought that he was in India? Maybe better ideas to make sure that we deal with climate change in a way that promotes jobs and growth. Nobody has a monopoly on what is a very hard problem, but I don't have much patience for anyone who denies that this challenge is real. We don't have time for a meeting of the Flat Earth Society. I hope everybody watching this can see through Obama's attempt to discredit Flat Earthers and also see that this very attempt in and of itself is a red flag that we are pushing some serious buttons. I ask you, how can a mere handful of alleged nutcases warrant a writing into a presidential speech? In the speech, Obama basically says he's willing to work with anybody, anybody but Flat Earthers, that is. As a flat earther, 
I'm not denying any environmental problems, but if we don't know the truth about the very structure of that said environment, then how can we work on a proper solution? Let's talk a little bit now about parallax. It's a sound concept, but its use to explain angular differences between observers is twisted. Look at this illustration on the upper right with the person sitting in the middle of the globe as a point of reference. Does that look impossible to you? However, if you look at it from a flat earth perspective, it makes perfect sense. He's sitting on the earth in the center, but if he moves to the outside, he creates a parallax. No big whoop. I've modified the other illustration so you could see the concept better. Did you notice that the other illustration uses a flat solar system to demonstrate the concept? So now we're moving from Earth to space, which leads us to our next slide. Let's talk a little bit about where space starts and what is gravity. From what I've gathered, space doesn't have a definitive point and the atmosphere just starts to get thinner and thinner. From what I could find, the effects of gravity are said to pull the atmosphere with it, with a decrease in effect as you get further away. Did you know that in the late 1950s and early 1960s, artificial radiation belts were formed from charged particles produced by detonation of nuclear weapons in space? Nice, right? The inner and more intense radiation belt extends from about 600 miles to 3,700 miles above the Earth. The outer belt extends about 9,300 miles to 15,500 miles above the Earth. So, they are both above the atmosphere, but within the range of where satellites are. I want you to note where the weather balloon is in this picture on the right. Not very high compared to the low orbiting satellite pictured above, right? Keep this in mind. Do these look like they are pictures from space? Now let's remember, we've just defined space, and it starts at about 6,200 miles. So look again. Does this look at least 6,200 miles up to you? Not so much anymore, right? Where's the curve? Why are we looking at the atmosphere from this angle? First off, they are clearly not that high up. And for second, Earth is flat. I want to make some personal shout-outs to some bloggers I came across recently. First shout-out is to the guy who posted this wonderful picture of the Grand Canyon showing how straight the horizon is for miles and miles. Even though you make fun of people who believe in creation, you're inadvertently helping to prove Earth is flat, so thank you. The other shout-out is to the mommy blogger who posted this picture from her airplane window with the comment, Sometimes you look out the window on a plane and it might look like this. It actually looks like I'm on a NASA shuttle looking at Earth from space, huh? Yes, it does. Thank you for pointing it out, Mommy Blogger with great observation skills. Weather balloon pictures versus pictures from space. Please, please tell me I'm not the only one seeing this. Doesn't anyone notice this? I feel like I'm taking crazy pills. These pictures are each of the screenshots I took after Googling the International Space Station and Googling weather balloon footage. This slide is in kilometers, but for miles we're talking about 223 miles difference. And I'm not seeing it. I see weather balloon pictures with the ISS photoshopped on it. That's what I'm seeing. And what about the curvature? Is it not all over the place? And let's talk a little bit more about weather balloon footage. I would like you to read this slide and then go and watch several amateur weather balloon videos. You can find some here on YouTube. The primary thing you're looking for is the flatness, but be observant because you never know what else you'll see. You'll also notice that while looking at these videos, how the horizon is flat when the camera is stable on it, but as soon as the camera moves up or down, we get a warped look. Not to mention how the horizon line stays at eye level, whereas if we were on a ball, we would be forced to look down to see the horizon. And that's a big thing I want you to observe. And while you're watching these videos, you might think, like I do, that it would be so cool to go into space. Who wouldn't, right? Do you think that's why so many amateur balloons are going up? Because people want to be there, right? Well, if you thought yes, you thought wrong. Apparently, people don't want to go to space bad enough to make it worth commercializing some shuttles. 
So they are telling me that people are willing to spend $20,000 for a penthouse suite on a cruise to Antarctica, but we can't get people in space? It sounds like all the reasons we don't send people into space are not really reasons, but excuses. What do you think? How much would you pay to see the moon up close? Yes, you might die, but is it any different than driving or flying in a plane? How many astronauts have died, statistically speaking? But Fran, what about the World View Group that's commercializing weather balloon flight? Well, I'm glad you brought that up. Let's discuss. I have one word for World View. Hoax. Look, there are no windows that aren't curved. Everything will be warped to look curved. If you review this slide and can't see through this hoax, then maybe your brain is too closed up and maybe this video is a waste of your time. For the rest of you, let's move on. My favorite science, geology. Now I know why Sheldon of the Big Bang Theory really hates geology so much. It doesn't need the Earth to be a globe to work. And I hope you know that geology is a real science. Geology isn't a real science! Operation, we are directly underneath the geology lab, and they're running their confounded sieve shakers again. Hey, gravel monkeys! You need to shake rocks, try jiggling your heads around! We're trying to think down here, you geo-loving feldspar jockeys! Dirt people rule! Over and over again, I see illustrations of how Earth works done using a flat model, even if it's representing very, very large distances. The illustrations used in this slide all came from different books, and the book in the middle is chocked full of illustrations just the same. And it is also chocked full of experiments to demonstrate how Earth works. And of the 100 experiments, only two use a globe, and they don't prove that the Earth is a globe. One of them is making a model of a globe, doesn't prove nothing, and the other is on the cover there and involves a spinning ball in some water to demonstrate the Coriolis effect, which we're about to talk about in slide 60. I just wanted you to note, before we move on, the use of this diagram, the one at the top left corner depicting a very large range of land with respect to a perfectly flat line of reference. I found that interesting. Also note the images of the Great Ridges extending many, many miles without any curving bulge in the middle. I apologize for the warp in the middle picture, though. I should have flattened the page better before I took a picture of it, but you get the idea. And since we're talking about ridges, let's get into the furnace below our feet. There is no denying that deeper into the earth is a very hot material. But do you think that the current volcanic system requires a globe to function as it does? The picture in the top left is a flat earth map with the approximation of the strong volcanic lines currently called the Ring of Fire and some of the more scattered concentrations. And I do think that the pattern is more interesting, don't you? So let's face some serious logic here. Pangea makes a lot more sense pictured here on a flat earth map with a supercontinent in the middle and an outward expansion and growth to the face of the Earth. Please excuse the fast Photoshop job I did on the Pangea model, but I've been going more for content here on this presentation than appearance. Do you still think that Pangea makes a lot of sense on a globe? I don't see how if the globe Earth formed the current way that is taught in schools that it would have formed so lopsided. It seems to me it should have formed with a more even distribution of materials. And speaking of lopsidedness, there are so many differences between the two poles and all those differences make more sense on the flat Earth model. Here are some of the differences. The Arctic has a normal melting cycle, only Antarctica has an ozone hole. Antarctica is the only place with no history of native people. Antarctica is a massive landmass underneath it, but still contains 90% of all ice on Earth. And the Antarctic polar vortex is stronger, and not too many factors are able to influence it. We're going to talk later about the ozone and vortices, but for now I wanted to show you how much Antarctica stands out. We just got done looking at Pangea, and on the globe models, Antarctica is shown as part of the group. Yet there is no history of life there, perhaps because it's the coldest place on Earth, but according to what's taught in school, it shouldn't have always been that way. 
Yes, there are penguins there now, but they swam from the tip of South America. I photoshopped yellow lines on these images to show you the variation of the route around Antarctica. Fran, why are your yellow lines going in opposite directions? It just looks like they are. Both are actually heading east and keeping east with north to their left while facing east. Did you notice that all the bases avoid the center? I'm sure there are a lot of excuses as to why, like, it's too cold, who would own it, it doesn't exist. Well, that last one's a good excuse. Fran, what about the people who have been to the South Pole? Yeah, let's talk about some of the early explorers. The first explorers to the alleged South Pole did out and back trips, not across. And I can completely understand why. They had to leave depots for themselves for the trip back, and I totally get it. Since then, however, with all of our great vehicle technology, why would it be a big deal? If we're expected to believe that we can send rovers to Mars, then how, I ask you, how hard can it be to send people this day and age through the South Pole? As far as I can tell, all the past people think that they're taking across Antarctica have been curved and off-centered which makes sense on the Flat Earth model. My utmost respect goes out to those early explorers of Antarctica. Read the stories of Robert Scott because they are amazing, even more so in my mind now than before. These people have actually been to the edges of Earth. Like many topics I've brought up so far, this one could use a presentation all of its own. There is so much controversy over this, and I don't want to get into that right now, but I do find it interesting from a Flat Earth perspective. As we've discussed, Antarctica is the gigantic, giant continental ring around our oceans and has been proven to be a no-man's land for as long as we can tell. Perhaps if we, and by we, I mean people like you and I, knew how it really worked, we would understand that this has probably always been this way and is no cause for alarm. Fran, are you saying that humans don't have an impact on our environment? No, I do think we have an impact on our environment. All I am saying is that this is just one more reason why we need to know what is really going on so that we can help our environment. And I ask you, how can we do that if we're being lied to about the very structure of that said environment? I looked up some images on Google for Southern Hemisphere from space. That was my search term, Southern Hemisphere from space. And this is what I got. This is my screenshot. First page. It's actually, I'm not even mad. That's amazing. <laughs> it's actually, I'm not even mad. That's amazing. <laughs> Have you ever noticed any odd connections you've had to make flying internationally? Of course you have, but just like me, you probably chalked it up to convenience of commercial hubs or something like that. What if you were in a pinch, however, and money wasn't an object? Do you think you can get a direct commercial flight from South America to Sydney, Australia? If not, why not? They're both relatively close on the globe, right? Look at the flight pattern map and the old telegraph cable route map on this slide and ask yourself honestly if that does not register as suspicious, considering we're supposed to be on a globe. Why go up to go back down? Since the globe is supposed to be pinching the southern lands together, why don't we see more things going on between those places and with downward curves as opposed to upward ones? If we can traverse the North Atlantic all the time from, say, New York to London on a nonstop flight, then why can't we do the same for Buenos Aires to Cape Town? Why? If you start putting most of the common routes used internationally on a flat earth map, you'll see that they make perfect sense. See for yourself and have fun playing online trying to get nonstops to the alleged southern hemisphere. I noticed that in a lot of the books, the illustrations used a circle with four corners and a dome over an observer standing in the middle on a flat plane. Is this not a bit odd to anybody that this is the best way to illustrate how one observes things in the sky, be it sun, moon, or stars from Earth? Let me read. Revelation chapter 7 verses 1 through 3, New King James Version. After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, or the sea, or, all, or on any tree. 
Since the four corners come up a few times in the Bible, I thought I'd play around with the idea on a flat earth, and I found it very interesting how things lined up. What do you think? Interesting, right? We'll get to the four winds later. Fran, are you saying we have a dome-like thing above the earth? My research is leading me to believe there is some sort of barrier between our world and another. For me, the primary reason is because of the Bible's description. However, science backs us up with things like radiation belts and the cosmic background radiation. Domes definitely seem to be popular in architecture and art. I find domes over a cylinder structure to be the most popular. Could this mean something? Did you know there was a series of high-altitude nuclear tests in 1962 by the United States called Operation Fishbowl, and they were part of the Operation Dominic nuclear test program? The dates that these took place are interesting because they were shortly after Antarctica was locked down with the Antarctic Treaty. The name Fishbowl is obviously interesting. The name Dominic may not be so obvious, but the name comes from the late Latin name Dominicus, which means of the Lord. And Saint Dominic is the patron saint of astronomers. If these tests were really about the Cold War, why were these names chosen? Why names about fishbowls, the Lord, and astronomy? Have you ever noticed how we get ideas for designs by learning about our environment? Like watching birds and bees and bats to see how best to fly? This is a slide of things I found interesting because their design makes you wonder, where'd they get that idea? At least for me they do. Flat Earth, perhaps? Where are we getting our ideas from anyway? Are we getting them from primitive people? How can we say that we are better and more evolved than ancient Egyptians when we don't even fully understand how they accomplished so much? One of the ways they were able to accomplish so much was by keeping many people ignorant so they can have slaves. Any knowledge they gained from observing the sky and conducting experiments was not shared with the masses, but instead used to increase their position. Not much has changed, has it? And if talking about ancient Egypt didn't creep you out, check out the creepiness you could find in your science books. What about this eye nebula? One of the several, I might add. So let's talk about what I like to call this thing with the eye. So what is this thing with the eye? Is this thing with the eye about the pineal gland? I've seen strong points made about it, and I do believe that the pineal gland is like a third eye. But what if the other thing with the eye is that we live in one? There is a group of flat earth believers who are looking into the idea that our world is in an eye. Some of the YouTube videos about this are quite good. I won't go into it too much because their research is extensive and well done. I do, however, want to talk with you for a minute about how literal we should take this model. It seems many of the flat earth eye theorists are taking this literally, but I'd like to suggest that perhaps our world is just like an eye, not literally an eye. But what do I know? I must point out something very interesting about Lindblad expeditions and National Geographic flags together. First, we have the eye logo for Lindblad, and then we have the void for the logo for Nat Geo. They could have put something in their yellow rectangle, but they didn't. Instead, they filled it with the black void. So together, we have an eye and a void. Interesting, right? And these two can take you to none other than Antarctica. Well, at least that one area where it meets South America anyway. Not the pole. Let's not get crazy, people. I played around with this idea in Photoshop. And that's the picture in the bottom left corner. It looks kind of stupid the way I did it all quick in about 15 minutes. But if you have a good imagination, you can see it's pretty cool. So, if we're in an eye-like structure, how does the lens work? I did some looking into this after I watched one of the Enter the Stars YouTube videos about the idea of heavens reflecting back to us like a spoon. It's pretty deep stuff and he does a good job, so I won't go into his specifics. I just want to point out what I found when I did a little bit of research in addition to some of his ideas. One is the deeper meaning behind the weird and catchy tune Yellow Submarine by the Beatles. I found this interesting picture from a book about angels in regard to a mirror of life where celestial beings, or angels, are looking down from a reflected mirror-like structure or something. The most interesting thing about this image is that I couldn't find anything more about it on the internet. I used all the information from the little excerpt from the book, but I just couldn't find anything on the internet. 
If you can find anything else about this image from some ancient Persian manuscript, I would love to know about it. Then we got this movie, The Matrix, telling us there is no spoon. And the movie uses a lot of reflective imagery. So why are they saying there's no spoon? Or maybe we live in a geode. Okay, I don't really think so. But what do I know, right? This is just some comic relief from all that heavy talk about living in eyes and there is no spoon. Before we get into more heavy talk about eyes. But this time, we're not talking about God's eyes. We're talking about our own eyes. Our eyes may be windows to our souls, but they sure are easy to trick, aren't they? Let's talk about the optical illusion of the moon and the sun often looking huge on the horizon. I do believe that this is an illusion. I split a picture of a horizon in half here, and I put the same exact size moon high in the sky, and the other dipped into the horizon a little. Does the moon on the left look a little bigger somehow? Looking at time-lapse pictures of the sun on the internet reveals effects that one would expect on a flat earth model were the sun not as big as we were told and actually moves around within the parameters of our world. These pictures on the slide are just a few examples, but I was able to find a lot of pictures that defy the optical illusion we just discussed. I was in Thule, Greenland once for a week, which is above the Arctic Circle, and the sun at that time did appear to change sizes as it made its moves. Wouldn't the distance created by the spin have to be negligible when we're talking about 93 million miles? I can't explain this with the globe model. Can you? Hold on, let me guess. More illusions and mirages. Illusions, deceptions, mirages. So let's talk about mirages for a minute. This painting comes from one of my books for artists and in the section regarding creating depth. As you can see, it helps to fade things out in the distance because it is what people actually observe in their world. I think we can all admit things in the air layer and layer out further we look. So why do any of us trust anything we see on a horizon? Horizons are a perspective thing and they condense miles and miles of heat and air particles into one thin line. Does that sound trustworthy to you? Glow people, please stop using sailing ships getting lost on a horizon as proof of a globe. And also, glow people, please stop saying that mirages can make things in the distance rise up from the alleged curvature because that is not what mirages do. Alright, let's go back to those pictures of the sun getting smaller and smaller and start thinking about some possibilities. We've also addressed anomalies with seeing the moon and the sun in the sky at the same time during the day. We've also seen how time-lapse photography has given us some interesting patterns. Now, I'm just throwing this out there, but could the sun and or the moon be in some vortex that creates some spirographic patterns all around the face of the earth? I played around with this idea in Photoshop, and it is hard to demonstrate using 2D since I can't show the up and down motion from this top angle, but even looking at things from a top angle could give us clues. This Photoshop idea is just one of endless possibilities, so don't go off on me. We're simply exploring concepts here. When the blue paths intersect the yellow paths, that might be when an eclipse occurs. Now, assuming the moon is indeed illuminated by the sun, we can see that without the sunlight, the moon would therefore be invisible since it is in the blackness up there. Could there be other objects invisible to us up there that for some reason are able to avoid the sun's light? So how might these mighty vortices work? What if what we call gravitational fields are really just different areas of a vortex? Spirals are very common vortex effects. So what could generate the vortices? Could it be as simple as the exchange of hot and cold temperatures, such as in the vortex tube? Could it be caused by a vibration? This could tie into the idea of Earth as the drum of a speaker-like system that we discussed earlier when we explored magnetic fields. Could there be a type of natural or unnatural, if you're into that, engine that operates under and around us? This engine could, say, generate winds from four directions, causing vortices of air and other matter we might understand. I placed a diagram of the Coriolis effect on a flat earth map. Do you think it's interesting? I lined it up with the four corners I made before, but this is just a visual for thought, not what might actually be taking place. 
We read the Bible where it talks about the four winds, and what is specifically interesting is that it takes four winds, basically, to generate a hurricane, as demonstrated in this image on the bottom right corner. Do you think tides need the gravity of the moon to work? Is there no other scientific explanation for waters to rise and drop? I bet you could think of a few right off the top of your head, like changes in pressure, for example. My personal theory is that we are missing a factor in the cycle of water within Earth. I think there may be something underground that sucks the water in, warms it up, and then spits it back out. Maybe something like a, like a geyser does. We all know that many geysers are known for being very regular with their cycles. A big daily cycle underground in a massive vast ocean somewhere we have missed where there could be portals for the waters to go to. But of course we aren't looking for those things. There is some good evidence done by other flat earthers in regards to debunking the moon's gravity. So if it's not the moon, then what is it? Wouldn't it be nice if the scientific community could break from their global shackles so we could stop wasting valuable time on these false theories? They've done studies, you know, 60% of the time it works every time. That doesn't make sense. I'm sorry if looking at that diagram of the Coriolis effect made you dizzy, but now we have to talk about the spinning ball Earth. A lot of flat earthers, myself included, believe Earth is stationary. I started to believe this when I took a cold hard look at what it means to be on a fast spinning ball with nothing but a thin layer of gas around it. I just cannot conceive how the air is deflected due to spinning, but the atmosphere stays put while spinning. They say the atmosphere moves with the spin, and that's why we can go straight up, hover for a few hours, and then land in the same spot. Because while we were up there in the air, we were spinning with the earth, because the air was spinning with the earth. Who told you something like that? What mook made that up? And what did the Michelson-Morley experiments actually prove? I've been grappling with this before I discovered the flat earth theory. I grapple with this idea that light can change frequencies due to motion, just like sound waves, and it can be bent and slowed down through various mediums, such as water. I also grapple with the idea that if light's speed is finite, why is that speed made out to be a limit through which one can travel through space and time? I'm supposed to believe that the light's medium is this stuff called space-time, but I'm not supposed to believe in an ether. I smell something fishy about this whole thing. I think Michelson and Morley proved that Earth doesn't spin, but because that went against too many cherished theories and would ruin reputations, that something else had to be thought up. Then along comes Einstein with his plastic space-time to save the day. Fishy like a can of tuna. Einstein's theories were definitely unique, and I like that and his ability to see the relativity of things was outstanding. I don't put him on a pedestal, though, because he didn't work the math all by himself, and he made mistakes that even the scientific community cannot deny. We can all agree that seeing spinning stars is relative, right? They would look the same way through time-lapse photography whether we were spinning or whether they were spinning. So who's spinning? Well, I say that the sky is. For the reasons we've just discussed in the last two slides, I don't believe we're the ones spinning. Isn't it a coincidence that the flat Earth center is where we can find Polaris, our North Star? Polaris is a very bright star that never moves, so that we all may use it to find our center. The Southern Hemisphere doesn't have such a star. Books I've seen, if they even mention the phenomenon at all for the Southern Hemisphere, always go over it very quickly and vaguely. I found a few experiments from the book, How Earth Works, that were very interesting to me. Two of them are on this slide, and the one on the left shows how changes in air pressure can make water rise. Anybody thinking tides? Just another example of how they could occur. This experiment on the left is the one that is supposed to demonstrate the Coriolis effect by spinning the flat dish with a very hot water around it and with a cup of ice in the center. I'm going to have to try this experiment myself, but without the spinning, and instead put ice on the outside of the dish as well. Fran, why don't more people know about this? On contraire, quite a lot of people know about it. The question is, who knows about it? Almost every leader in the United Nations probably knows about it. Just look at their logo and all their meeting places. It just whispers, we know. 
Everybody in on the fakery from NASA probably knows about it. Probably nobles. Some of the super rich and famous probably know about it. This might be one of the big secrets of the secret societies, and so their leaders probably know about it. And now we're on to it too. These power players have done their best to keep it secret, but it's coming out now. If you start looking around now that you've been made aware, you'll start noticing the little things and the clues. While my kids were in vacation Bible school, I was just a little freaked out by the theme this year, knowing what I know now. Check out the images on the left with a couple of the journey off the map graphics. The bottom one is obvious, but did you notice the symbology on the top one? What about the cosmic city image? Interesting choice, right? Now look at Google's trend of Earth Day images. Perhaps Google folks got flack for not showing the globe enough. This year, flat Earth is spreading like wildfire. So they came back this year with an in your face, we're in space on a globe version. There, powers that be. Are you happy now? I'm speculating, of course, but wow, is that globe huge. Makes me, as a graphic designer, think of that song, Make the Logo Bigger. Except in this case, it's Make the Globe Bigger. Oh, and show the southern hemisphere and downplay the enormity of Antarctica while you're at it. All right, folks, we're winding down here, getting close to the end of the presentation. Thank you for hanging in there. So obviously that Google picture was just some computer graphics, but surely we have hundreds of real pictures of our globe from afar. No, we don't. I cannot find one picture that wasn't proved fake or admittedly computer generated. Don't be fooled by the word composite as I used to be, because I do believe that they are using real pictures of Earth to generate their fake graphics. It proves we can take a bunch of pictures and make something fake seem pretty real. I guess it proves that, but nothing else. All I ask is for one honest-to-God picture of the globe spinning in space. Is that too much to ask? It's kind of like when you're looking through some new vacation pictures, and you're just a little more interested in the ones you're in. Well, same for humans with Earth. We want to see the pictures that we're in. We want to check ourselves out, don't we? But instead, we get ridiculous details of far-off places. Yeah, those are nice, but where's our picture? Way to give us cool pictures that no regular human being can ever disprove. But two can play at this game, NASA. I can play too. Here are a bunch of pictures of rock surfaces. Or are they? If I told you these were pictures of rocks from here on Earth, would you believe me? Probably, but they're not all rocks. And can you guess which ones aren't? No offense, but chances are you'll get it wrong. Things are not always what they seem. And for my final proof that things are not always what they seem... Hey! Look at these lucky people who get to see the solar eclipse from Mars! Need I say any more? So where do we go from here? You don't have to be obsessed or change your life to make a contribution to this effort for truth. There are a lot of areas that you can choose to focus on that work best for your lifestyle and interest. Okay, you've made it. You've made it to the ends of the earth. Thank you for watching this all the way through, and I hope you got something out of it. If you have any questions about the books or other sources that I used, feel free to ask. Thanks again for coming on this journey with me, and if you have time, here are some outtakes for you to enjoy.